Well, good morning, everybody. Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We're going to continue Caleb Little booming. We're going to continue in our study of the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. If you're using a pew Bible, it's page 807. And I just want to give you a little bit of overview of, of how I'm going to walk through this passage uh, today. We're going to spend most of our time in the life of David and the, the Davidic covenant that follows him. And then we're going to just simply touch on the remainder of the people in the genealogy. It, it, it's a, a daunting task, and there's so many people to cover 14 different people in a, in a short period of time. So we want to focus on the high point because really one of the major themes that we're seeing here is the D Davidic covenant. And so we want to look at that, and um, we know that Je Jeff last week did a good job, and uh, we looked at Abraham to, to King David. Today we're looking at King David, and as I said, more particularly the Davidic covenant and continuing through Josiah, and next week we'll finish the genealogy uh, with Jeconiah to, to Christ. So go ahead and read with me, beginning in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 1, verse 10. We'll be focusing on verses 6 through 10. The Word of God reads, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah. Let's pray. Father, we, we come before you, and Lord, we're reminded of that your word tells us that nothing shall ever pass away from your law, that your, your law is good, your word is true, and Lord, these, these words are the, are the words of life. Lord, we thank you for the disciple Matthew and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these, these truths down, to, to show us who you are and to give us a glimpse of, of why our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the rightful heir to the throne of David. Lord, we pray that you would use these, these verses today, Lord, to, to grow us in our understanding of your word, to grow us in our understanding of, of who you are, to, to grow us in our understanding of Christ and and his rightful, uh, his rightful access to the throne of David, and also, Lord, that we can see that you are a gracious God, and you're mighty to save. We thank you again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When you look at each gospel, we see that each gospel account presents Jesus Christ from a, a different perspective. Matthew presents Jesus Christ as the king, and so if Jesus is being presented as, to us as the king, we need to make sure that, that he meets the criteria of who the king is. We need to make sure that he has a right access to the throne of God, that he is the true heir of the throne of David. So that is why the gospel of Matthew begins with this genealogy. We know that preaching a, a genealogy is difficult, 
I have to admit that. And when we first decided to, as a group of elders, I was kind of like, how is this going to work? How are we going to work through it? Do we have, do we have the time? How many, how many people are we going to do? I remember just speaking briefly with my wife. We're going to be doing the genealogy. And she's like, really? You're going to be doing the genealogy? And so, you know, going into this, it's a, it's a daunting task, but it's a, a necessary task to see who, who Jesus Christ is. Last week, Jeff did a great job of showing us why this is, is so important. He reminded us that, of what Paul tells us, that every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a, a, an offspring of Abraham. We are count, counted as children of Abraham, heirs according to the promise. And that promise is what God made to Abraham. Jeff's main idea that he said last week is these 14 significant names, the 14 that he was covering last week, these 14 significant names that summarize Jesus' royal heritage through Joseph and legitimize him to be the, the promised king, the son of Abraham, so that we can worship Jesus Christ and teach the nations to obey the king. Well, we can say almost the same exact thing today, can't we? We have 14 people or 14 kings that we're going to look at that show us that, that Jesus is the promised king, the son of David, and that we might take that, we might go and we might proclaim that he is the, the sovereign king of kings and, and lord of lords. And, and Jeff told us that the Abrahamic covenant really has its foundation in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where Satan is told that there would be a seed that would come and that would crush his head. And so when we look at the, when we look at the Bible, we, we look at the Bible as who is this one that is, is going to come and, and to make everything right? And that's what, what God is doing. He, he's unfolding this um, throughout the Bible. And, and this, this book of Matthew, this genealogy, is, is really looking at almost a, a history of the whole Old, Old Testament. Who is this seed? And so Jeff talked about the Abrahamic covenant and in that covenant, it includes the, the promised land, the, the promise of, of descendants, the promise of, a, of blessing and redemption. In Abraham, all the nations of the, the earth will be blessed through the seed of Abraham. But one of the things that I found encouraging, and I think it, it's a connection to what we're going to look at today, is that in Genesis 17, verse 5 through 6, it says this, "'No longer shall your name be called Abram,' but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into, into nations, and kings shall come from you. And we see that being listed here, that these kings are, are coming, and ultimately we know that the true king is eventually going to come, and, and he's going to be a fulfillment of exactly what is said there in Genesis. But these kings would, would come through Abraham, but but more specifically, they, not just Abraham, it would, it would come through Isaac, we're told, and it would come through Jacob, and then we see Jacob pronouncing a blessing on his sons, and he comes to Judah, and he says to Judah, he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. This royal scepter, that he would, from him would come a ruler, and we know that eventually what we see is that, that King David comes, and he comes through Judah, the tribe of Judah, and so back in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, we see this. And this is really the introduction to the book of Matthew. And it says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And this is a connection of the Old Testament and, and the New Testament. We have, we have to see the, this connection because Matthew is a, a, a Jewish gospel. It's, it's written to, to a Jewish people. And the Old Testament it's a Jewish book. Yes, it's expanded to the whole world, but you see this connection, and it begins, Matthew begins with the genealogy, really a history lesson, so that the New Testament would be grounded in, in the Old Testament, so that they would become one message, one central focus, and that focus is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Matthew is, is trying to impress two things on us through this genealogy. One is that that Jesus Christ is the rightful heir to the, to the throne of David. Nobody, nobody in all of history could fulfill this promise. Nobody could fulfill the, the Davidic covenant. 
There's no man in history that can fulfill this genealogy and, and have the rightful access to the throne of David. And we, we see this as, as Matthew lays out these people and you look back at their history, you see that they're all fallen. They all fall short. Looking for the seed of the woman from Genesis 3.15 through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, you're looking for the seed. This seed has to be perfect. He has to be the one that is going to... And so Matthew shows us not only that, that David would be the rightful heir to the throne through this genealogy, but the second thing that he does is he, he shows us that, that Jesus is a king like no other. He's a king like no other. Jesus is so extremely different. And it's, it's sad when people, I mean, certainly we celebrate, celebrate Christmas and, and people have all these different ideas and they, they think we're, we're, we're simply celebrating the birth of this simple human baby that was maybe a good person that taught some good things. But Jesus Christ, and Kevin touched on this in, in communion, right? Jesus Christ, how was he born? He was born from a virgin birth. People want to discount that and say, no, that's not true. He wasn't that. But in order to fulfill what was spoken here in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1 regarding the genealogy and, and fulfilling the Davidic covenant, he had to be born of a virgin. We'll see that really more next week. And so this is a testimony and a, and a picture of, of the fact that, that Jesus Christ is the rightful heir, but secondly, we see this, that, that he's a king like no other, and this entire genealogy is comprised of idolaters, and deceivers, and, and prostitutes, and adulterers, and murderers, and outcasts, and Canaanites, and Moabites, liars, wicked and cursed kings, a leper, and other sinners. It's a testimony and picture of the, of the grace of God that out of the, the rebellious and the adulterers would come forth the Son of God. I mean, what a, who would have thought? I mean, is, is that what you would have decided to do if you were God? Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, I'm going to have my son be born into a line of, of wicked and adulterous people? Of course not. We would say, no, we, we have to write this. And it's a, it's a, a testimony of the, of the word of God that it is true because we wouldn't do it this way. We wouldn't write the word of God this way. And it also shows the, the height and the depth and the, the breadth and the length of the mercy of God. There's none of us here today that is so sinful and so far cast out that we, can enter, we can't enter the kingdom of God. For it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself that came forth from su such a genealogy as this. And so this genealogy is there to show us that Jesus Christ is one the rightful heir to the throne of David, but also to demonstrate the extraordinary grace of God, <laughs> that he's a gracious God. No matter what your background is or where you have come, no matter whether you have come from a sinful background or a, a self-righteous background, there is so much grace that God has for sinners, and this genealogy is evidence for that. Because he could have easily destroyed every king as, as, as they were wicked, but, but he makes a covenant with David, and a covenant that's unconditional. It's not based any, on anything David would do, and it's not based on anything that any of these kings would do. And so when we come to verse 6, beginning in our, our genealogy, it says this. It says, And Jesse... The father of David was, was father, the father of David, the king. So the question is, who is David in the Bible? Who is David in the Bible? And there's so much written about David in the Bible. We could, we could simply spend weeks and weeks and weeks studying all that he did, all that he said, all that he wrote. I mean, he wrote most of the, of, of the Psalms. But who is this David in we know that we're, we're told that he is a man after God's own heart. And we're first introduced to, to David. The people, what do they do? They say, we want a king, and they raise up Saul, and Saul becomes king, and, and Saul continually does wrong, and, and he's not God's chosen king. And so as Saul is making one mistake after another, God sends Samuel to find his chosen shepherd, David, the son of Jesse. And so, so Samuel goes to, to Jesse, and, and he seeks for this king, and 
This is the, the time that we're first introduced to David, and David is believed at this point to be probably anywhere from 12 to, to 16 years of age and when he's anointed, and he was the youngest of Jesse's sons, and he's, in a, in a human sense, he's really an unlikely candidate. In fact, when Samuel gets there, Samuel thought that Eliab, David's oldest brother, was surely the one that was going to be anointed. And God says to, to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, he says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord is so different from us. He's so different from us. He looks, he looks at the heart. He, he sees the heart. He, he doesn't judge from outward appearances. He, he judges the heart. And in this scene, these seven sons of, of Jesse are, are brought before Samuel, and I can assume that Jesse's there, and one son after another comes by, and, and he says, no, it's not him, it's not him, it's not him, it's not him. They all pass by. And I just got this picture as I was, as I was studying that, that they're all standing there, and they, and, and they line up, and Samuel says, isn't there anybody else? And these brothers and, and their father, Jesse, all kind of turn and look to the, to the pasture. Well, we got this young brother of ours out there shepherding the sheep. And Samuel says, bring him in. Bring him here. And Samuel anoints him with oil as the future king of Israel. And it says at that point that the, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. It rushed upon David for, from that day forward. David was, David was the first God-chosen king of Israel. Samuel was, was the first king, but I mean, Saul was the first king, but, but Saul was whose choice? The people's choice. I'm going to be God's choice. David was God's choice. In the very next verse, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And in, in order to help Saul, what they do is they, they look for somebody who can come in and, and play music to Saul so that, to calm him down, and they actually choose David. And David was skilled as a skilled musician, and he comes in and, and he plays music for Saul, and, and Saul likes David, and he likes what he's doing, and but eventually, eventually he turns against David. And we know the story that the story that many of us know is David and Goliath. And to David, David was not often at the battle side. He was too young to be with his brothers, and his brothers were out there. And one day David comes to bring them some things, and he comes and and his brothers see him, and they kind of get on his case. What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. And David, David hears this, this taunt of a giant, this giant Goliath, and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is he? Goliath's coming out for 40 days, day after day, and nobody will fight him. David, this young shepherd boy, comes and says, look, I'll do this. They put his armor on him, and I mean, they put Saul's armor on him, and it doesn't fit, so he says, no, just take it off. He, he gets his sling and his stones, and he goes, and he says this to, to Goliath. He says, you come to me with sword and with spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I mean, you hear that David completely trusts in God and his zeal for God's glory are, are remarkable. He just, 
he's fearless because he knows that, that, that God is with him and, and he kills Goliath and, and Saul's jealousy of David turns and he, he gets so jealous that he wants to murder him. And for the rest of his life, he, he is seeking out Saul, I mean, he's seeking out David to, to put him to death. And the, the amazing thing about David is David never raises a hand against Saul, even when he could kill him. He never raises a hand against the king, against God's anointed. And even when Saul died, David mourned for Saul. I mean, how many of us, if, if we had somebody seeking after us and, and, and trying to kill us, Year after year after year, when they finally died, we would mourn for them. But David mourns, and it shows that he's, he is truly a man after God's own heart. Eventually, David comes, and this is when we get to the Davidic covenant, and David becomes king, and he, he conquers all his enemies. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse, verses 1 and 2, you can, you can turn there, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Verses 1 and 2, David, David has conquered all his enemies, and he, he wants to build a house for the Lord. It says in verse 1, Now, when the king lived in a house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Nathan basically says, hey, David, if this is what you want to do, you want to do. But, he, but Nathan himself had not heard from the, word, from the Lord himself. So Nathan goes home, and it says that that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell David, my, ser my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since a day since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all the places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God didn't ask for this. David simply wants to, to bless the Lord. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel. He's going he's gonna to restore the land and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be, be, dis, uh, be disturbed no more, and violent men shall aff afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. And it, it's interesting, there's a, there's a play on words there, because what has David said? I want to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord comes back and says, no, David, I'm going to I'm going to build you a house. And he's not talking about a physical house. He's talking about making him a, a dynasty. And he goes on in verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be, I will be to him a father and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, and speaking, I believe, of Solomon in this case, I will discipline him with the rod of, of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, when I put away from, who I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And so while there's references, I, I, I believe, to Solomon building... Uh, God a temple here. He, say, he says to David, it's not you that's going to build it, it's going to be Solomon. It, it, there's references to Solomon's sin. But we see that in this passage, there's these promises, these messianic promises that God is going to establish David's throne and his kingdom forever and that somebody would, will eventually come. And we know that that somebody is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that he will come and he will sit on David's throne. So I believe that the, the word of God is speaking both of Solomon prophetically of the Messiah to come. And in a parallel passage in 1 Chronicles 17, there's no mention of, of Solomon there. And there's, there's no mention of sin. And I, in one of the things about 1 Chronicles, it's after the, the deportation to Babylon. So it's, it's long after, it's written long after Solomon has, has died. But there's, this just shows that this is a, a messianic promise and that the Davidic covenant is summarized in those words that, that, that he's going to build them a house and he's promising a dynasty in the lineage of David. He's, he's offering a kingdom referring to the people who are governed by a king. Speaking of a throne, emphasizing the authority of the king's rule. And he uses this word forever, emphasizing the eternal and unconditional nature of this promise to David and Israel. This Davidic covenant is an unconditional promise to David that, that somebody will sit on the throne of David and he'll do so for, for all eternity. And with these promises, promises to David, David responds with all humility and he says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18, Who am I, O God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? Who am I? David's just a, a shepherd boy, and yet God is going to establish his kingdom forever. And although David is a, a man after God's own heart, he was also human. He was also sinful. And back in our passage in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew makes that clear. With just these simple words in Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, and David was the father of Solomon. And then he adds these words, by the wife of Uriah. <laughs> I mean, those, those are some loaded words. What he's saying is that David is an adulterer, David is a, a murderer, and Matthew is underscoring the moral failures of David, and he, he speaks of Bathsheba and Uriah, and he doesn't have have to because you, you notice that David doesn't list any of the other mothers, but he gets to David and he says, this is what is true of the, the greatest king Israel has ever, uh, has ever seen, that he's an adulterer and he's, he's a, a murderer by the wife of Uriah, and he's saying that it would be through David, this one who committed adultery with Bathsheba and who murdered Uriah, from this union would come forth a messianic line through Solomon. And it speaks to how God's grace is greater than all of our sins. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. It's not just, you know, you commit one sin and you're out. God takes people where they are, and if they repent of their sin and they turn to the Lord, God will use them, and God's grace will restore them, and God will use them. And this is what he did with David. And so with Solomon, we know that from Solomon, the royal line of the kingdom is established through his line. And so we look at Solomon, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And when Solomon ascends to the throne, he, is, he seeks after God, and, and God gave him opportunity to ask for whatever he wanted. What did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom. Could have asked for anything. God gives him wisdom, and he gives him riches, and God gave him uh, wealth beyond anybody. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings on the earth, it says. But Solomon, like his father David, didn't always follow the Lord, did he? First Kings chapter 11, verse 9 and 10 says this, And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. Yet Solomon did go after other gods. It goes on, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you. And will give it to your servant. We know that ser servant was the servant Jeroboam. It goes on, yet 
for the sake of David, your father, because, because of the D Davidic covenant, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. He'll tear it from the hand of his son. The son would be Rehoboam, and during the days of, of his kingdom, the, the kingdom was divided. We know that there was 10 tribes in the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, two tribes in the southern kingdom known as, as Judah. And Rehoboam was made king, and his reign was marked by civil war with Israel. And unfortunately, after King Rehoboam became established in the southern kingdom, says that he abandoned the law of the Lord. And in response to that, the Lord said in verse 5 of Chron First Chron Second Chronicles chapter 12, Thus says the Lord, You abandoned me, so I have abandoned you to the hand of Shishak, who was the king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt comes and he, he plunders their cities and he comes to Jerusalem and eventually takes out all the things out of the temple. There's no way for them to, to worship the way that God had commanded them. He divides the kingdom. There's no pl uh, central place of worship. There's no longer unity in the nation. And the throne of David loses much of its power and its glory. Rehoboam wasn't the promised one, was he? <laughs> David wasn't the promised one. Solomon wasn't the promised one. Rehoboam wasn't the promised one. After Rehoboam, the father of, he became the father of Abijah, and Abijah reigned for only three years. Three years, not a very long reign, and Abijah was a wicked king. First Kings chapter 15, verse 3 says, And he walked in all the sins that his father did before him, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Again, we see this, that that even though he's three generations away, what does the word of God say? That David was his father, or David was his ancestor. That's important for us to look at later. And he was the father. It goes on to say that Abijah was the father of Asaph. Another name for Asaph is Asa. It says of Asa that he ruled for 41 years. Verse 15. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 15, 10 says, And Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as David his father had done. But inf unfortunately, and later on in his reign, he, he again turns from the Lord. The life of Asa is an example to all of us how easy it is to dr drift away from the Lord. Asa began his reign with a strong commitment to God, but as years went by, his dedication faltered, bringing unsuccess unnecessary trouble to him and to his kingdom. Brothers and sisters, the Christian walk is a marathon. It's not a sprint. We don't just do it for time. It's, it's, a, it's a trial. It's, it, it's a marathon that we have to continue to, to work at, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Asaph became the father of Jehoshaphat, spiritually Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat began his reign in, also in a positive way. Second Chronicles 17 says of him, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. Again, you see that it's, it's constantly speaking of, of David because it's, it's the Davidic covenant. Jehoshaphat goes on and he appoints judges. He sends men throughout the, Judah to teach the law of the Lord. He calls a fast and the whole na nation participates in it. And although Jehoshaphat started his reign by removing the idolatrous high places, the end of his reign, there was still a lot to do. Still a lot to do, and Jehoshaphat also started well, but his diligence, fa diligence faded, and the idol worship returned. And then Jehoshaphat became the father of Joram, or Jehoram. And we know that Word of God says that he followed in the, his father's footsteps. And in fact, Joram married King Asaph, um, I'm sorry, King Ahab's daughter. King Ahab was the, 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 the wickedest king in Israel, in the northern kingdom. And in order to make an alliance, he, he marries Ahab's daughter, and, 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 and she's a pagan worshiper. And sadly, God's mercy at 
had no effect on, on Joram. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 6, it says, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, basically following after his, his wife, as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. Who is that lamp? Who is that lamp? It's, it's Jesus Christ. The light shining in the, the darkness of has seen a great light. It's Jesus. And so we see that, that Joram rejects the, the grace of God, and, but, but God doesn't destroy him. Why? Because of David. Because of the covenant that he had made. And he promises that he will bring that Messiah. Just for your information, there are three kings. If you look back at 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, there are three kings that are not in the genealogy here. They're, they're skipped over. They're Ahaz, Joash, and Amaziah. And so, as I said earlier, when it says, of my father David, even though David is generations away, we, we understand that it, this idea of father can be ancestors and so we see that Joram is the father of Uzziah, or he's an ancestor of, of Uzziah. And King Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 52 years in Judah. It says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. It's good news. He followed Zechariah the prophet, but unfortunately, King Uzziah's fame and strength led him to become proud. And this led to his downfall. In fact, what Uzziah did is he, he went into the temple and he offered incense. He offered incense, which was only allowed for the, the priests. And his, his pride had, had brought him to the place where he didn't think that, that he had to follow the law of the Lord as king. He felt that he could do whatever he wanted. He, he, he was not a humble, it was not a humble thing for him to do. And, and these, these priests, these 80 priests led by Azariah, try to stop him. Don't do this, king. And you know what Uzziah does? He starts to rail on them. Who are you to tell me what to do? I'm the king. And right as he's doing this, leprosy breaks out on him. And he runs from the temple and it says he lived in a house for the rest of his days. And he never went back into the temple. But it's interesting. Remember Isaiah chapter 6? What does Isaiah say? He was, Isaiah was in the temple and it says, that In the year that King Uzziah, Uzziah die, died, I was in the temple and I saw the, the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filling the temple... And Isaiah says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. I think there's a connection there that the Lord appears as soon as Uzziah dies. Because, you know, Uzziah had, had taken things into his own hand. In some ways, like Saul did. You know, Saul took things into his own hand. Uzziah takes things into his own hand and and he becomes a leper, and we know that he was the, it says here that he was the father of Jotham, and Jotham became king of Judah at the age of 25, and he reigned for 16 years. It says of him in 2 Chronicles 27, 2, that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah had done. And I like this, except he did not enter the temple of the Lord. <laughs> Smart son. <laughs> but the people still followed corrupt practices. But despite Jotham's godly example, we come to his son Ahaz. And his son Ahaz proved to be a, a wicked king. And, and you know, it, it, it's, you can do all that you can to raise your children in a godly way, and it, there's no guarantee 
There's no guarantee. And we have to trust God with, with our children. You know, it says, it says that, that Jotham did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah did. He even did better, better than his father Uzziah, but his son comes, and Ahaz ends up being one of the most wicked kings that there, there is. Some of his wicked deeds included sacrificing his own children. He desecrated, he desecrated the temple. He, he set up pagan altars in Jerusalem. He nailed the temple door shut so that they couldn't worship in there. And then he placed altars at all the street corners in Jerusalem and the high places for worshiping, worshiping false gods in every city in the land of Judah. I mean, here you have a godly father and you just turn and, and you become so wicked and we don't understand that. But, but the flip side can happen too, right? Because many of us were not raised in Christian homes, yet we have come to the Lord. And so God is good and gracious. He becomes, he's the father of Hezekiah, and the Bible describes Hezekiah as a king who had a, a close relationship with God. How is that? One, one generation is, is wicked, the next generation is good, the next generation is wicked. In 2 Chronicles 31.20 says of Hezekiah, he did what was good and right and, and faithful before the Lord his God. He cleansed all the things that his, his father had done. He, he took down the pagan altars. He destroyed those pagan temples. He opened the doors of the temple. He, he restored the Levitical priesthood and the Passover. Because King Hezekiah put God first in everything he did, God prospered him. Second Kings says of him in Second Kings chapter 18, verse 5 through 7, he says, the throne there, there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. In his later years, he has a, a son, and that son is Manasseh, who would turn out to be the evilest king ever to reign in Judah. I mean, you, you just see this the cyclical process, and it, it reminds me of the book of Judges, like, kind of like a spiral that's just going down. Yes, every once in a while you see this, this promise, like, oh, things are getting better, but then things just get worse and worse. And we see that in, in our day-to-day. -day. Sometimes we think, oh, things are, are getting better, right, Steve? <laughs> but then we see other things that seem to be getting worse and worse, and Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he, he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem, it says. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people. He sacrificed his son in the fire. He practiced divination. He sought omens. He consulted mediums and spiritists. He did so much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger also says that, moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. Besides the sin that he made Judah to sin so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He was wicked. So what we've seen, we, we've seen these, these kings, and many of them start off good, and, and then they turn at the end of their lives. But the one good thing about Manasseh is that he was bad and very evil, but he actually turns to the Lord. And that's a testimony to us, right? That if, if we are sinners, we can also turn to the Lord. In 2 Chronicles, um, we read that, that he was actually captured by the Assyrians, and while he was imprisoned by them, he humbled himself and he prayed to the Lord. And God was moved by the entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem and into his kingdom then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. And praise God, that even though Manasseh had a, a, a personal conversion, things were still not that good, were they? No, again, we, we still have that spiral. He was never able to lead Judah out of the sin that he had previously led them to. You know, we want to repent. True? 
I mean, when we sin, we want to repent, but, but it is better not to sin. It is better to obey the Lord. Because when we fall into sin, there are always consequences to it. And we can never, never heal all of those consequences. Surely we can make things right as much as we possibly can. But it is better to obey than to sacrifice. So it's better to obey than to sacrifice. It's better to obey than to repent. So Manasseh became the father of Amos. And the set of Amos in 2 Chronicles 33, 22 through 23, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had done. Amos, or Ammon, sacrificed all, to all the images that Manasseh, his father, had made and served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself. But this Ammon incurred guilt more and more. So again, you see this spiral going down and going down, and Ammon did evil in God's sight. Eventually, his own servants killed him, and he became the father of Josiah. And we know that Josiah was probably the, the most righteous of, of all the kings. It says in 2 Kings chapter 23 through 25, it says, Before him there was no king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. He was a righteous king, but he was not the king of kings. God's wrath would, would later come upon Judah due to the evil king Manasseh and what he had done, but the judgment was delayed because of Josiah's godly life and leadership. And you see that this, as I said, is, is so much like the, the book of Judges. There's, it's, it's almost like a, a roller coaster that's, that's always going downhill. There's, there's climbs now and then, but you eventually hit rock bottom. And what we see is that there are these, these kings that do somewhat good, Asaph and Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah and Josiah. And from this genealogy, we do learn that Jesus Christ is the rightful heir to the throne. There's nobody like him, and there's no man in human history that could have fulfilled this genealogy and have the rightful access to the, to the throne of David. And we learn this, and, and this is what sets Jesus Christ apart as the, the king like no other, a king that is gracious and compassionate, a king who is, is mighty to save, one who is, who is pure, one who is wise, one who is fearless, one who is steadfast, one who is immovable, who is, who is not fickle, that doesn't go back and forth. He's, he, he's a steadfast king that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a king that we can trust. And next week, we're going to continue this series, and we're going to see that, that this lineage of, of, of the messianic king, the Lord Jesus Christ, is actually going to be cursed. You have to come next week to see how that curse can be broken. John says in Revelation 5, he says this, Then I saw in the light, right hand of him who was seated on the, on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to, to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll. That's, that's our hope. We don't, look, we don't look to men to be our leaders. I think in our day and age, I think that's an encouragement to all of us. We don't look to men to be our leaders. We look to our, our king, the Messiah. He is the Messiah, and he deserves our loyalty and our worship because he is the king like no other. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
We thank you that you have given us your, your one and only son, and Lord, that through him we might have everlasting life in his kingdom. We thank you for your word that, that teaches us that, that this seed of the woman would be coming, and Lord, that he would be our deliverer, that he would crush the head of, of the serpent, that he would sit on the throne, that he would be not only a, a king, but he would be a priest, that he would offer his, his very self on the cross for our sins. Lord, we, th we thank you again for the grace that we have in him, Lord, that, that we can be forgiven, that we can be restored, that we can be useful for his kingdom purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.